Welcome to PayPod, the show that features thought-provoking interviews with leaders and entrepreneurs in the payments and financial technology industries. From credit card processing to Bitcoin, we cover it all. So if you want to know what's happening right now in the payments industry, stay tuned. Now, here's your host, Scott Hawksworth. Hey, how's it going, PayPod listeners? I'm Scott back with you, and we have yet another quality episode on tap for you today. On this show, we're going to be taking a look at the state of payments and fintech right now and with a look towards 2020. 2019 was a great year for innovation in payments and fintech, with many businesses and organizations taking big steps forward. Many businesses and banks also navigated various challenges in the industry, and of course, there remains so much potential for 2020 and beyond. So what's the quote-unquote state of the union, so to speak? I'm fortunate to be joined by another podcast host and fintech professional by the name of Jason Pereira, who will be able to shed some light on all of this for us. Jason hosts a podcast himself called Fintech Impact, which delivers fantastic interviews with various experts in finance and fintech. He's been in the financial industry since 1997, and trust me when I say he lives and breathes this stuff, so we are so happy to have him here. Jason, welcome to the show. Thanks, Scott. Appreciate it. To start us off, can you tell us just a little bit about your career in fintech? How'd you end up getting into the industry and, and where you are today? Yeah, so my fintech quote unquote career happened almost through, um, through osmosis. So I am a financial planner by trade and a technophile by heart, I like to say, and always been an early adopter of just about everything. So the number of betas I've been on is just it boggles the mind. Um, so what happened was, was when the fintech scene really started to pick up several years ago, um, I had the fortune of living in Toronto, uh, Canada's largest city, and also one of probably the top five fintech hubs in the world. And we started to see a lot of just random plays start to spring up. And I've been following various fintech ventures around the world for a while, but it was nice to see it started to become homegrown. And uh, I would see these people come up with these interesting platforms and think, I would love to use that in my own business. So I'd end up emailing the founders and asking them if they contemplated working on some sort of advisor platform. And the response was always, how did you find me? It's like, well, your first name at URL.com. It's very easy. You're a technologist. This is this is kind of a playbook. Uh, and it's, <laughs> exactly. Right. And then the second piece uh, was, um, you know, wait a sec. Who are you? You're a practitioner who's under the age of 60, who understands how to use a computer, and you're already talking to me about product market fit and alignment and distribution channels. Like, can we meet for coffee? And what I very quickly found was that essentially these guys were very much in most cases not looking to destroy all old distribution, but trying to find ways to leverage it. And most of the time they couldn't find any anyone willing to talk to them because everybody was just terrified of what fintech was potentially going to put them out of business and whatnot. So, so especially what happened was that um, that led to a lot of interesting relationships and a lot of friendships and along the way. And, uh, you know, the reason for my podcast, which we'll get into later, but it also led to um, opportunities. Lots of opportunities with two small startups that I've worked on uh, that we saw ex- gaps in the market in regulation and in integration in our country. And we basically have started those up in still early stages. And then some other more recent uh, advisory roles and another bigger one announcement coming hopefully next year, which I cannot get into now. But nevertheless, um, I've kind of become the, the, for lack of a better term, the fintech industry's advisor uh, or or traditional practitioner who's, who's able to give them that perspective. Absolutely. And I, I love how so many things begin with just a nice email and just reaching out. I feel like more people need to do that. So that's so awesome. That story of that uh, that working out and helping you really get into this industry in a, in a significant way. I filled a niche that, was, that I didn't even know existed. So it worked out well. So now you mentioned this. You host an excellent podcast called Fintech Impact. I'm curious, what's the story behind it? What kinds of topics do you tend to cover? How, how did it start? How did you go from, okay, you're, you're meeting with folks for coffee and then you're like, you know what? I want to make a podcast about this. Yeah, so you know, I'll preface this by saying I've been a podcast addict forever, and I've uh, often contemplated, you know, maybe I should do one myself. But I'm I'm the kind of person who doesn't ever do an also ran. I feel like I need to do something unique at all times, which is sometimes to my detriment, but nevertheless, it's the way I feel. And what happened was just as I got to know the landscape, and I would just be networking with other financial advisors and professionals. 
they kind of like look at me like, holy crap, how do you know all this stuff? And it's just like, well, I'm, I'm out there and I'm, I'm having these conversations. And next thing you know, I started getting offers to speak at conferences. And that's when I very much kind of woke up to the fact that I fit this very weird little Venn diagram of traditional practitioners who understand technology and have something to offer to both communities. And that's when I started saying, okay, well, maybe that's my unique podcast opportunity. And I went and started listening to other podcasts. And I found that most of them, quite honestly, were more B2B enterprise level conversations, right? Less, less mm -hmm. not bridging the gap between practitioners at the current level and technologists and kind of trying to, so the goal of the podcast was to kind of address that gap and help kind of dispel the myths of competition create more collaboration, communication, and just kind of inform people who were in the dark and didn't know what to turn as to, you know, was their business being threatened or was this technology they could leverage? That's kind of the origin story. So we basically cover a various gamut of topics. First and foremost, it's an interview format. So I will talk to technologists and people in the industry who are basically starting from scratch or, or, or take or moved into existing companies and running these, th these, these areas and talk about what it is that they've built and their story and their journey and what it is they're trying to accomplish so people can understand what it is that they're doing a value. And then we also round that out with conversations with other people of interest, to consultants in the area, work with lots of fintechs, the companies that are implementing some of these technology solutions and leveraging them properly, and the venture capitalists as well. What is it they're looking for? Why are they putting this kind of money into these areas? And, and what kind of appeals to them? And how is this of appeal to their general partnerships beyond just return? So it's, it's kind of an all-encompassing look at the universe of what's going on in the fintech space. That's fantastic. And and again, I highly recommend everyone listening, check that out. I'm actually going to be on a future episode. We recorded it this week. So you know, if you want to hear me talk a little bit more about high-risk payments and those kinds of things, that'll be great. So okay, today I want to talk about where payments and fintech are as we close 2019 and head into 2020 and beyond. And I want to dive into payments specifically first. In the past few years, there has been and continues to be some big disruptions in the space from the likes of Square and Stripe. Folks listening, you know about these guys. Jason, what are your thoughts on what Stripe and Square are doing from a strategic standpoint to succeed? And how do you think they might continue to grow and continue to disrupt, really. Yeah, I think that their value proposition rested in one thing and one thing only. And it was the elimination of massive points of friction that existed in the marketplace before. And because of it, they both become rocket ships. You know, you think back to the world of what it was like to set up online payments before the likes of Stripe. PayPal was an option. There was various other options. But these guys made it as easy as anyone could ever hope. I've literally had clients set up online businesses, refer them to Stripe. They don't understand a line of code to save their lives, and they're up and running within a couple of minutes. Uh, and they really pioneered that online. And consequently, and, and by, in parallel, what happened on the online sphere with Stripe is exactly what happened in the real life sphere with Square, right? It took out the need, they eliminated the need for bulky machines and contracts and all that sort of stuff that was causing problems for, not causing, but it was a barrier to entry, whether it's a valid barrier to entry in terms of the amount of work that was done or just a perceptual one, just from the standpoint of the consumer. They literally leveraged a revolutionary technology and the computers that are all in our pockets to simply add a little plastic dongle onto a, onto a sound port and made it easy for anyone to start taking credit cards the same day. And one cannot underestimate the power of elimination of friction. And these two companies have proven that something as simple as payments, you know what? It was sleepy. It was it was cumbersome. You know, you did it once and people people thought, okay, well, yeah, it's a little bit of a pain to get it done initially, but you know what? Once it's done, you really don't have to touch it forever. So, you know, let's not worry about that too much. They basically said, no, that's the only thing to worry about. And, and they went after it. Um, so that's, that was the secret to their success. And so many businesses are based off of, huge businesses are based off the elimination of friction. That's how they got to where they are. How do I think they continue to grow and disrupt? That's a good question. I think we, we exist in a world where the relationship with everything is changing. And money is one of the prime areas of that. Uh, you know, you think back 10, 15 years ago and how many people have said, you know, I have never put my credit card into a computer. I'm not going to buy anything online. It's too dangerous, right? Whereas now, I mean, frankly, Amazon dominates online retail to a point that dominates the retail space in general. They dominate uh, traditional retailers and they've gotten past that. 
So every technology is first off looked at skeptically and with concern, but then over time becomes ubiquitous. And so what we're seeing is that, you know, Stripe and Square have helped make that ubiquitous, but the future, I think, for payments and for flows of money in general becomes one of even more reduced friction and ubiquity. So what do I mean by that? I can envision a future very, that's very simply set where I can very simply say to Alexa or Siri or whomever it is, and I'm sorry if I triggered anyone's uh, voice machines at this point, but I simply, you know, oh, you know, buy me this or like do that. Right. And whatever it is, it just gets done. Like right now, if you order that through an Amazon Echo, it goes and sits in your shopping cart, right? Waiting for final authorization. That's a step to build trust. At a certain point, we're going to start to look at that shopping cart as friction, right? So what's going to happen is I think we're going to see a world full of greater voice enablement is one thing. And then secondly, what we're also going to see is that the security side of this is going to be handled in a creative way, which is essentially through what we call a cloud of authentication. So it's not just my voice that authorized it. It's the fact that my voice authorized it on a device that was in proximity of my Apple Watch, which I put on this morning, put on the code and did not take out off my wrist. So therefore it knows it's on the same person's wrist. And my phone's also there, right? And I'm also in my house, right? Being able to authenticate people and who they are based on multiple points of biometric data and geopositioning data to basically remove the friction point of authentication. So I think that's going to happen. I don't know how well Stripe and Square are positioned to handle that. Uh, they might be part of that ecosystem, but owning that ecosystem is something that I don't think they can do. Yeah, absolutely. And and I really love how how you have emphasized this sort of friction reduction because you know I've had interviews with lots of different folks that are um, you know, in fintech or payments, and they're working to reduce that friction. I think the other thing that Stripe and Square have done is really change, I think, a lot of the expectation that your average merchant has. And we run into this a lot when now in this kind of immediacy economy, we get calls from folks who, you know, maybe Stripe or Square shut them down because they don't work with their type of business. And then they expect, okay, like I just called in, I submitted an application, so I'm going to be approved in 30 minutes. <laughs> it's like, no, 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 no. <laughs> it's a little different. I'm curious, Jason, how do you think traditional payments businesses are adjusting to these disruptors? Are they taking the right lessons away and evolving? What do you see maybe them moving towards to compete with the margins that Square keeps eating into or the nice ease with which you can just send out this little dongle that plugs into your phone and, and you're good to go? What are you seeing in terms of I guess the competitive angle. So I think there, there's a couple of angles to look at this. There's the traditional payments, you know, payment merchants, which we're going to provide you the machines, the back end, all of that. And then there's the, not just the stripes, the squares of the world, but who else is entering this space and the changing relationship with money in general. Right. Um, so I think what, what traditional merchants, I've seen several of them do is basically it's, it's not even so much them as, well, it's partially them, but it's the enablement of the right partnerships in order to win in other capacities. So for example, your company is a perfect example of this. You took an underserviced part of the market that was having difficulty and frankly figured out a niche that you could exploit and your partner, not exploit, but take advantage of in, in a good way. And sure. partnered with you know traditional payment providers in the back end to provide that service. But what you're doing is essentially, you're doing something that a lot of large enterprise businesses struggle with, which is how do you, you know, is it profitable for them to spend the amount of time to understand these issues and build out these capacities themselves where they're such a large company? The answer is from a lot of cases, no, but it is, it is profitable for smaller start startups to start to do that and build out their own ecosystem. So mm -hmm. I think what the traditional players have done is they've gotten smarter about the right partners. And I think also, consequentially, there's been more startups looking to service the market as the middleman there trying to figure all this out. So yourselves is one of them. There's been just several other ones, Park Place Payments. I know you had uh, Samantha on, on the podcast previously. Yep. Similar trying to you know win on service, win on relationship, right? So because at the end of the day, every market's the same when it comes to value proposition. You have the mass market, which is going to make money based off of ease, cost, and convenience. And then you have the niche markets, which are all smaller, but are going to make money based off service or unique value proposition. Everyone in the middle gets crushed, right? So the only way that these traditional players can basically continue to exist going forward is to not only evolve their payment technologies into the future paradigms of what those are going to look like, but also to A, compete on the mass market side through 
cost, convenience, and whatever else is possible that they can do to leverage that. But at the same time, nurture the other end of the spectrum, which is those niche players such as yourself, because that's a sizable market, but no one market's big enough for them to target. So that's that's the first piece of it. The second piece of it is, I think, frankly, there's a saying in, there's a saying in business or in, in technology that Apple got us used to beautiful and, and Amazon got us used to instant. I would argue that, frankly, you know, the same thing is true for Stripe and Square when it comes to payments. But I think the biggest threat in the payment space or the biggest changer in the, in players in the biggest payment space is not going to be Stripe and Square. I think what you're seeing is that the large scale tech companies Amazon, Google, and Apple are slowly making inroads into this space. I don't think there's a single better online purchasing experience than Apple Pay, quite honestly. Uh, I specifically go shopping online with Safari and I do everything else in Chrome simply because I don't want to bother putting in my credit card. I mean, I've got password record keepers like LastPass protecting me from any kind of security issue there. But I know that when I get to that payment card and I click on Apple Pay, I'm going to get this little notification to basically because I wear an Apple Watch too, to just double click my watch to authorize the payment, right? And that's, that's the now, right? Like, again, in the future, that could simply be, oh yeah, we, we know you're at your Mac, we know you're at this computer, you're wearing the watch, and we've authenticated you through the camera uh, and mapped your face. So we know it's you, so therefore we're going to authorize it, right? You know, when you look at what that type of technology and where it could lead, I think the companies that are aggregating the attention whether it be the Apples of the world or the Googles of the world, who, by the way, Google just got into checking accounts. Those are going to be the interesting players there altogether. I think they're going to push the margins of what's, what's possible there. And I, so the bigger traditional players are going to start figuring out who to partner with of the big boys. No, I think that's a really great point. And I'm, it's just got my wheels spinning, just thinking about that merchant who's been using Macs their whole life. And, you know, what if Apple's just doing that bridge and, oh, I'm starting my e-commerce website. And Apple's like, oh, great. You don't have to do anything. Boom, you're set up. Now all the Apple Watch users can go to your website or whatever. You know, all the Apple Pay users can do it. What kind of synergies can there be when you put the muscle of like an Apple or an Amazon behind it? And that could be incredible. It is. And I think, again, right now, money is a construct that exists that's went from existing in the physical realm to existing online. And we crossed that bridge. But I think the future of money is ubiquity, is, is the reality that we're going to basically without even thinking about the physical presence or location or device, be able to transact in any number of ways by simply stating it. Absolutely. This, I think, is a perfect segue to my next question. You know, we're talking about money. We're talking about the ubiquity of money. You can't really talk about fintech today and into the future without mentioning cryptocurrencies. I've had all sorts of crypto enthusiasts on this show this year, from the Bitcoin maximalists to guys trying to pin crypto to the US dollar, i.e. stable coins, to guys talking about ICOs and wanting to invest in some up and coming coin and ending up driving a Lambo a few months later. It really runs the gamut. I'm curious, Jason, do you think cryptocurrencies are here to stay? Might it only be Bitcoin or is the bottom potentially going to fall out of all of this due to regulation or some other factors? I think that blockchain is the single biggest revolution online since hypertext language. Like, honestly, it is it is going to become a fundamental backbone protocol of the Internet. As for the currency play, does Bitcoin become recognizes its own kind of separate currency to the general population. That's a very hard road. And it's a very, it's one that's hard to tell that that, that happens. Now, don't get me wrong. I look at this from a very Western perspective, right? Like I live in a relatively right. stable currency country of Canada. I mean, you can argue that currency swings of, you know, going from 60 cents, uh, 60 cents against the US dollar to a dollar 10 and then back down to like 70 something isn't the most stable thing. But those are swings that happened over decades as opposed to overnight, which is what some other countries basically will see is massive 23 mm percent -hmm. shifts, right? So if you're living in a country like when Zimbabwe was undergoing massive hyperinflation or Venezuela or whatever, quite frankly, yeah. the daily fluctuations of Bitcoin are nothing compared to your alternative, right? So in cases of countries with massive currency insecurity, they are definitely incentivized to look to something like this. Does that spread throughout the world in terms of its adoption rate? I think that there's definitely roadblocks and regulation is not the least of them. So I think Bitcoin is going to be around in general. I think it's largely because of network effects. Uh, you know, you look at the number of, of people who've basically programmed and developed systems around Bitcoin as the standard, and it dwarfs that of even the second number two player. So because of sheer adoption rates, it will probably likely be 
somewhere in this ecosystem providing value, maybe as kind of like a gold reserve type thing where you don't trade, you trade some other currency, but then when you want to kind of aggregate into one larger one, you use Bitcoin. Who knows what that's going to look like? There's also all kinds of environmental challenges. I don't know where that goes, but the reality is, is that network effects are powerful, right? And in general, the world does not move towards the optimal. It moves towards satisficing. So if Bitcoin is good enough to do all this stuff and the network gets big enough, it'll be very hard for the, the better mousetrap to over to overpower them. Now, as for blockchain in general, that is going to become more and more the underlying methodology for how we basically transact anything, quite honestly, because it eliminates the need for reconciliation. And someone once shared with me the amount of money being spent on reconciliation and just one major bank and it was utterly staggering and the the, you know you start thinking about that and that the you know processes that took months on end in some cases when it got me got into reconciliation of things like contracts for commodity futures right like actual delivery of these commodities you know some of these reconciliation processes were months long and they've been replaced with non-existent reconciliation processes now there is incredible potential there so where does it go does it become the currency i don't know i really don't know because i think that this is very early days but i do think the underlying technology is sound and i think that underlying technology is going to drive a lot of things but i don't know which currency plans up on it sure and and i want to actually stay on blockchain for a minute, you know, because we've had a number of guests on all sides of the fence around blockchain technology. I've had folks who are working for organizations leveraging blockchain technology for things like identity verification and security. And one of my recent guests basically said that that blockchain is just a marketing term and it's completely overhyped and dead. You kind of touched on the promise of it, but what's the reality of blockchain and what's the deal with it? How exciting is it? Okay, it comes down to this. How else do you prevent double spend problems on the internet where everything can be multiplied everywhere? You can't. You know, since the inception of the internet, going back to even the 60s, no one has solved this the problem that blockchain solved. And it is incredibly valuable as a concept. Now, as for it as a currency, I still question that and I still wonder the validity of that. Is it dead? Absolutely not. Is it overhyped? Absolutely it was and probably still is. Uh, Just to share a quick story with that, I mean, I teach financial planning at a local university on occasion. And when I talked about different asset classes to invest, one of the students afterwards said, said, you know, I think your model is a little bit out of date. It doesn't take into effect like cryptocurrencies and everything like that. This was like three years ago, to which I smirked and said, respectfully, I think you need to be around for longer than a couple of years before you get considered a asset class as valid as everything else. And he started giving me an example of how he was at a hackathon and how he basically, you know, they did this project and that went on, you know, data from that project went on the blockchain. And I looked at him, I said, okay, please tell me why that kind of data requires a immutable source of, of record keeping. Right. <laughs> Basically, it was like, you know, we're taking all the data from all these thermostats in a building and then we're putting it on the blockchain so we can better manage the, use that data, better manage the power usage consumption for for heating and cooling. And I said, you know, I looked at him and said, like, why does this require a blockchain? Like, who cares if someone goes in and hacks the one number on the thermostat for to, to make yeah. it higher or lower? Like, who's got the incentive for that? It makes no sense. So he kind of just like, you know, when I said that, he kind of just bowed his head and he's like, holy crap. Yeah. Like, and the problem is, is that when, you know, there's an exciting new hammer out there, everything looks like a nail, but blockchain is also a highly inefficient standpoint of the protocol when it comes to power consumption and use of computing power versus just having one ledger, right? So it should be used absolutely in wisdom. But unfortunately, during the hype cycle, it started getting used for everything that didn't make sense. So it doesn't invalidate its value, uh, but it, it, but it's basically got to like anything else. It's going to be used in wisdom. Yeah, yeah, it's it's a nice heel cautionary. Okay, yeah, this, there's a lot of potential here, but let's let's also think about the application and not just slap blockchain on something and think that that makes it worthwhile. <laughs> yeah, like I, I said to him, even like, okay, so how many nodes are there? Who's incentivized to maintain these nodes? Like, there's so many pieces to this, and he had no answer for any of it. And it was just like it was just cool because we use the blockchain, right? Like, <laughs> right? No, 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 no. Stop. You know, congratulations. You're now more power efficient in the running of that business, of that building, but now your orders of magnitude less power efficient in the computing power. That makes no sense. Right. Banking is another area that continues to see innovation in fintech, specifically neobanks, which are 100% mobile banks without branches and many of the things you expect with traditional banking. I personally don't know anyone who banks with a neobank here in the U.S., 
but I know there are lots of people that are adopting it. I'm curious, what's your take on neobanks from an adoption standpoint? What are they succeeding with? Where do they have to grow? And maybe what are some of the pitfalls that that need to be navigated? I'm really curious about this too, just because of really this intersection between mobile technology and banking and kind of where we're headed there. Yeah, so your timing is interesting. I actually was uh, had coffee yesterday with the CEO of Canada's largest neobank um, company called Coho. They've been around for about three or four years, something like that. And they are, we don't have a ton of financial institutions in Canada. We tend to be concentrated. But when you look at where they are, I think there are over 200,000 users. And that would put them somewhere in the neighborhood of like the eighth largest deposit taking authority in the country. Um, so pretty big. And, <laughs> yeah. So in, in a remarkably short amount of time with a remarkably better user experience. And, you know, they keep on making more and more inroads into customer service. I mean, their premium metal card signup list basically has 75,000 people waiting on it. Right. So they're doing good things and they're doing new and innovative things, basically forging partnerships with robo advisors and, and working conjunctions with other industries like wealth management who basically compete with large scale banks in other capacities to kind of put a moat around their clients and prevent the clients from actually going to a large scale bank who's going to compete with them. So they're doing a lot of innovative and interesting things. The largest player in the world, Revolut, who's recently just come to Canada and I'm on their, I'm on their early test yet again, they boast something over 7 million depositors around the world. And that's in like four years. That in, you know, in wow. corollary in Canada, yeah. that would put them in, in place of like the number four bank in the country, right? So there may be slow adoption in certain geographic areas, but on the whole, they're growing and they're growing at a very good clip. And what they're doing is providing value in ways that traditional banks just simply wouldn't, weren't willing to jeopardize those lines of business or just uninterested in because it wasn't profitable to them. For example, the multi-currency function of Revolut, I can hold currency, I can hold something like over 20 different currencies all on the same card. And when I spend money in that currency, it automatically debits that account. It will basically do FX transactions uh, with no with no commission cost. There's a service in, you know, Coho service in Canada, which will do price matches. So you just bought something, take a picture of the receipt, and they will see if they can basically uh, find you that receipt, you know, that same product at a lower price on a price match guarantee and get the, re- get the person who sold it to you to refund the difference back to your card. They're turning the service offering of banks on their head and, and competing with a far, far better experience. And you know what? The people who haven't, who are listening, who use the Neil Bank that are listening to this, and if you're in the States, you know, look at SoFi and whoever else is there. And I think Revolut's in the US as well. Just order a card, put 50 bucks in it and see how much more convenient and customer friendly the experience is than traditional banks. Now, that being said, you know, the pitfalls really are frankly imposed by the existing systems. The banking system in general tries to be very very rent-seeking and preventing competition. In the US, you guys are very lax in that, co- well, not lax, what's the word I'm looking for? You're very much more open to banking competition. But in most countries, Canada included, you only have a handful of players that control the majority of the market and they do everything mm-hmm. they can to prevent those companies and these players from scaling. I think if anything, these neo banks have the ability that as they grow to potentially start working in co-opetition to put even bigger dents in the traditional banking sphere. One of the things that kind of excites me is an opportunity for them, and maybe it's blockchain you can use on the back end. We all have frustration with the fact that one of the bottlenecks is that if you want to move money from your traditional bank to these banks, you're talking about a bank transfer that takes something like two to three days, right? Because the, right, ex- right. the existing bank infrastructure you know, was built in the 60s and no one wants to upgrade it because they're making too much money charging fees to work over top of the complexity. So the reality is, is that what point did the neo banks get enough deposit base that they can say, you know what, traditional banks, we're just going to start dealing with ourselves wherever possible. And if I have two different neo banks, one I use domestically and one I use, you know, in a different country or use uh, for for international travel, facilitate the movement of money between those accounts instantaneously, right? Uh, you know, what point they get right. enough deposit base that they can start just dealing, you know, saying, hey, yeah, we know you deal with this bank, but uh, it's going to take you three days. But by the way, if you want to move to that card, it's going to take it's going to take ten seconds. Right. And then that value proposition further dent the traditional banking sphere by saying, holy crap, okay, so there's two types of banks in this world those who reduce friction for me and those who just have who have friction that's akin to the friction I had 20 years ago. Where do you think I want my paycheck deposit? It's not going to be the bricks and mortar anymore. Absolutely. And it really does tie perfectly into also what we were talking about with payments and things like that. And just if you can reduce that friction, there is so much potential there and consumers will move right towards it when, you know, it's, do you want to wait three days or do you want this right now? 
like, well, I'll take it now. Thank you. <laughs> Absolutely. It's just, it doesn't, I, you know, as I always say, it's not a bug, it's a feature. The reality is, is that the technology and the ability to basically replace these systems has existed for quite a while and there's been discussion of it. But the reality is, is that there's a really good Planet Money podcast that explains the history of, of the payment systems for banks and sending money between banks. And, you know, the rules around them are ridiculous. They work bankers hours. Like these servers only work on weekdays. They basically are so cumbersome that the banks have had to hire staff to do manual entries and workarounds in order to make these things work properly. And they make so much money off of this that now, you know, the large banks, it's a sizable amount that shows up on their income statement. And no one wants to see that revenue disappear, even if the profitability improves, right? So again, it's not a problem. It's a choice that they've made. And at a certain point, I sincerely hope that the new generation of banks basically finally controls enough cash to say, guess what? There's now two standards for services. The one that we are doing that's next generation. And if you want to be rent seeking and, and be a pain in the butt to your consumers and yourself out, but it's only going to hurt you long run. Yep. All right, Jason, we have a segment that we like to end with on every show. It's five questions, rapid fire. Are you ready? Yep. Go for it. Make a prediction about the future of payments that you expect will happen in the next 12 to 24 months. So, you know, end of 2020 or beyond. 12 to 24 months. Uh, we are far more similar than we are different today. <laughs> uh, those <laughs> timelines are not things, are not, not when monumental shifts happen. The prediction I will make is I do predict that traditional technology vendors will continue to push in to this space in an incremental way. I mean, I can already pay for different purchases online, utilizing Apple Pay, Google Pay, Amazon Pay, Alipay. The reality is, is that they have customer loyalty and attention. They are going to continue to leverage that. They're going to find ways to continue to leverage that into other areas of finance. What's one cool piece of payment-related technology that you've come across recently that impressed you? Given I've seen just about everything, uh, the answer is pretty much nothing. Um, you know, <laughs> I see it all incrementally happen. Let me share a story about something similar. So I'll take you a little bit off topic here, but sure. an idea of where the future is going to lead. I already talked about the ubiquity of payments, right? And I think that's really where it's going to go. And you know, if you look at it now and the adoption rate of voice-enabled payments that exists on, say, Alexa's already, I've talked to consultants and the reality is the banks are really excited about this, but no one is using it. And my belief is that that is a generational issue. None of us grew up in a world where voice was the interface, right? And there's an mm -hmm. abstract concept to that. But... When my daughter was 18 months old, she reached over to my watch, pushed the button, and proceeded to babble into it. And that hit me like a rock, saying, oh, my God, I can't imagine what this is going to turn into, given the fact that this child from that early in age, she is growing up in a world where voice is the interface. She will never right. think it odd. She will never find it abstract. She will never do any of that. And that, to me is so what we've seen thus far is the basic level of that technology which already exists what that holds in promise in the future is going to be remarkable i agree 100% and and i think i'd also add that the technology itself the the voice recognition is going to continue to improve i think you know one of the challenges is you know i'm a 90s kid i remember the jokes about the apple newton and things like that and how, yeah, how the, the voice <laughs> Yeah, yeah, exactly. Like how the voice recognition was so poor and things like that. It's going to continue to improve. So yeah, we are absolutely heading towards that kind of world. So yeah, I can see yeah. it. In the next five years, most Canadians will make a purchase with either Bitcoin, Apple Pay, some other thing. Which one and why? I think Bitcoin's at the bottom of that list. It will be Apple Pay, Google Pay, Amazon Pay, whatever it is. The vast majority of time being spent online is being spent with their phones. The phones all support NFC payments. So whatever ecosystem you're locking yourself into, it's going to be that. So I'll tell you, the only time I see Amazon Pay is when I'm shopping online. I see Alipay everywhere now because the Chinese people either with, with, with deposits mm -hmm. back there, so they're used to it. It's ubiquitous over there. So anyone who controls the ecosystem on a phone is going to own the primary point of payment. What's one piece of advice you would have for someone who's considering the payments or fintech industry as a career? I talk about this on occasion. The reality is, and I don't have the stats in front of me, and I wish I did, there is no bigger industry or scalability than payments. Uh, the number of transactions that happen worldwide and the total number of dollars changing hands, it doesn't matter what rounding error of a percentage you put on that. It is enormous. 
it is just daunting to think of the numbers on any scale. And because of that, it is attractive to many, many businesses. That's why we have so many different companies in the payment sphere and especially in the fintech payment sphere. And so the reality is nothing scales like money. We're in a bit of a fintech land grab right now. I think that no one has truly cracked what the relationship will be in, with money in 10, 20 years. I think it's a slow grind and evolution. But I would say that if you're looking for a career in this space, if you're with a traditional vendor, you better be looking for someone who's got who's forward looking and looking at innovation and, and stuff beyond just, you know, point of sale terminals, because frankly, you can get a point of sale terminal now from Stripe at a local Staples and get that going. That may not be the cheapest option, but it's that quick and quick and easy sometimes exceeds price. So what is that vendor in traditional space looking to do to innovate and move along? If you're in a fintech space, what are they doing to also not be an also ran? Uh, and frankly, I think there's going to be lots of opportunities with these neo banks that, you know, that neo bank, the Canadian neo bank I talked to yesterday, they're going to increase their headcount by something like 60 to 70% in the next 12 months. Wow. So there's lots of opportunity. Last question here. What's the best business advice that you've ever received and from whom? Ooh, that's a hard one. So I'm going to do something that probably no one else has done yet. I love it. I think that, and this is going to sound incredibly arrogant, but the general, it's a general piece of advice on business and strategic thinking altogether. And I am the first person who said this, at least as far as I know. So the advice I, I, when I talk to different businesses, especially in the tech sphere or in the financial sphere, where the world has largely been about keeping your client by putting up obstacles and creating friction. Like, could you not, if you look at it, it's very obvious that the financial industry does what it can to create friction because they think friction is a way of keeping your client. My response at all times is friction is not a way of keeping your client. Friction is a way of pissing them off. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and if you want to play that game, you are already admitting you're in a losing proposition. And frankly, if you do the opposite, which is enable concepts like open banking, if you are the early disruptor, if you let them have access to their data wherever they damn well please and basically make it easy for them to move money, they will opt into choosing you because you know what? The old system was basically saying, oh, well, oh, it's such a pain in the ass to move this new thing that I may as well just stay with the old thing because they're all the same, right? New companies are proving that they're not all the same. They're providing value propositions that are far greater and far more customer centric than the traditional businesses. And it doesn't matter if the traditional financial institutions start talking about customer centricity, which by the way, the term customer centric is like the new word versus the new synergy. It's a word that they all blabble out, but they have no idea what it truly means. <laughs> right. Every time they talk about that, they then turn around and say, yeah, but if we do that, it'll be easier for them to, them to leave. You know what? You should... Second piece of advice, golden rule, treat a consumer the way you would want to be treated. And that means that the second they decide to go for the door, you should let them and not get in their way. So steer into the disruption, enable, and basically do not think of friction as a way to keep your client. You're just going to piss them off. And the company that doesn't do that, that enables them and shows that they're not afraid of competition is the one who's going to win the, the greatest degree of loyalty. I love it, Jason. That is fantastic advice. We heard it here first. <laughs> Jason. Thank you so, so much for joining me on the show today and sharing your perspective on the world of payments and fintech. It's been a fantastic year and I'm, I'm so excited to see the future. So thank you for joining me. Cool. Thank you. It was, uh, this was a pleasure and uh, it's, it's always different to be on the other side of the microphone. <laughs> Absolutely. And before I let you go, if folks are interested in listening to your show, connecting with you, where should they go? How should they find you? Yeah, a couple of ways. So uh, the website is currently at fintechimpact.co. That is actually going to be changing at some point in January. I'm uh, rebranding a bunch of personal different distribution models under one personal brand site. So you're going to be able to find me at Jason Pereira, P-E-R-E-I-R-A. .ca. That will be sometime in January if you're hearing this later on. My core business, Woodgate Financial, is woodgate.com. Uh, but as for FinTech Impact and that podcast, you can find it on literally every podcast service known to man. So, and uh, typically scores top two in the world, so it shouldn't be that hard to find. Awesome. Thanks again, Jason. Thank you. So that completes our show today. Thanks so much for listening. And don't forget to subscribe if you like the show. You can do so on iTunes, Google Play, and many other platforms. So until next time, I'll see you then. And thanks again for listening. Thank you for listening to another episode of PayPod, brought to you by Soar Payments. 
Soar Payments is a leading merchant services provider for e-commerce, high-risk, and hard-to-place businesses. If you'd like to get the latest PayPod episode sent to you automatically, subscribe to the show via iTunes or Stitcher, or visit soarpay.com slash podcast. Thank you.